it's of course a pleasure and a privilege for me to be there. I just got to know that uh, your institute is also 20 years old, in fact, as Ukraine. And in August this year, we, we had a special date of uh, 20 years of, of Ukrainian independence. Uh, in, my, in my speech, I'll try to address mainly EU-related issues, and I'll try also uh, to give you a sort of my vision where we are as a head of negotiating team for the Australian Agreement, uh, as a senior person for visa-free dialogue, but, uh, you know, for other different issues with special relation to the EU because somehow I've been dealing now with the EU directly or indirectly uh, you know, for, for 15 years practically over a you know, larger part of my diplomatic career. So I will map out a, a number of points but I will be happy you know, to take up any sort of questions uh, related to uh, other foreign policy subjects in our Q&A session. And uh, it, it will be great actually to answer, or better to say, to try to answer any sort of questions uh, you, could, uh, you could put uh, on me. Uh, you know, I, I first uh, turned my attention uh, on the EU, also uh, working, working out uh, the very famous October Memorandum, because uh, we've just talked about Chernobyl and nuclear safety. October Memorandum concluded in 1995 was a milestone was a milestone for Ukraine, but also was a milestone for G7, how to deal with Chernobyl. And at that time, we, uh, we started you know, negotiating with the European Union on what model could be chosen for, for the way forward. And uh, at that time, we uh, had for our bilateral relations with the EU, Partnership and Cooperation Agreement, signed in 1994. Uh, next time, I was somehow forced uh, to deal with the European Union. I tried simply to get the agreement and uh, to understand where we are. What is about partnership and what is about cooperation? You know, the agreement uh, has, has quite a limited scope. Also, also practically, it's about probably a couple of thousands of pages. And it took me probably an hour and a half to read the partnership and cooperation agreement. And at that time, I, I believed I understood what it's all about, EU-Ukraine relations. It was about partnership and it was about cooperation. And, uh, you know, for, excuse me for, for a sort of uh, platitude, but cooperation is important. Cooperation could be stronger, but cooperation couldn't be somehow deeper in the sense if we are talking about integration. And it was uh, my, my first lesson on the European Union. Uh, you know that at the beginning of the 90s, a number of Europe agreements were concluded between the EU and now new member states and then still accession states. You know, I still miss the point here. And I still believe that Ukraine somehow should have concluded the same agreement. Not the partnership cooperation agreement at that time. I understand that the point I'm now trying to get across could be seen as a bit controversial. But for me, it's a missed opportunity. The missed opportunity in the sense that back to the mid-90s, 
we could have had a real Europe agreement, which could be the basis not for cooperation, but for political association and economic integration at that time. And for me, it would have, uh, you know, gone beyond beyond uh, the normal pattern of a EU enlargement. And here, uh, I remember one uh, one interesting conversation in my, in my time when I was posted in London as a minister councillor. As the former French ambassador to London, I will not recall his name because we are on record now. Over coffee told me, you know, Paolo, we are talking with you about enlargement. But uh, this wave of enlargement for me is not about enlargement itself. For me, it's about uh, reunification, about reunification. It's, it's about common history, it's about common mentality, it's about common roots. So enlargement to Poland is about reunification. And if we decide, I mean, the European Union, to enlarge to Ukraine, it will be a real enlargement and not uh, reunification. And it was a very interesting point in my understanding, actually, what is the difference between understanding what is a part of Europe and what is not a part of Europe. And it's my, my second point. My third point uh, is about uh, our progress in understanding where we were and where we are in our relations with the European Union. Because uh, I, I've been following different stages. I've been following the implementation of the Partnership and Cooperation Agreement, the famous EU-Ukraine Action Plan. And in 2007, both Ukraine and the European Union decided to start elaborating a completely new type of agreement, association agreement. And the novelty of this agreement is about, is about different substance, about different rationale. Because it should be based on two important principles, on political association and economic integration. The sense of political association is about converging our policies also foreign policies in different senses. It's about deeper cooperation in different spheres, but it's also about values. And in the future association agreement, we will have the definition of values exactly as they are defined in the Article 2 of the Lisbon Treaty. So the definition will be completely the same and our future agreement will be based on the same understanding, and I mean also legally binding understanding of values as it put in the Lisbon Treaty. But economic integration is, uh, is for me, uh, and in our concept, is about uh, incrementally, of course, but integrated into the common market on the basis of extension of all four freedoms to Ukraine. Of course, it will be, it will be quite, quite a difficult process. And, uh, you know, the European Union does not have any problem with the extension of the first freedom or the second freedom to Ukraine. But the other way around, the fourth freedom, the freedom of movement, is, uh, is quite contentious because uh, it's an uh, extremely sensitive issue. But at the end of the day, economic integration is, is about extension of all freedoms to Ukraine. And in that sense, the future association agreement should become an, a, a, a unique instrument a unique instrument, not for, uh, for, for, uh, for a sort of uh, foreign policy mechanism, 
but as a sort of future framework for for reforms in Ukraine. And uh, we discovered and we introduced a special novelty in our agreement because we will attach special uh, list of EU legislation, directives, you know, Ukraine will have to approximate its legislation to, to every sector, to every bit of the agreement. If we talk about subtle cooperation, for example, let's take transport cooperation. So we will have a list of EU key attached to this article about transport cooperation. And it will be about uh, respective EU documents, but it, uh, we will be talking also about tentative time frames for such approximation. So it will be a kind of roadmap of approximating uh, our legislation to the EU ones for the years to come. Approximately for, for the time frame of 10 years. Of course, uh, we would like to be ambitious and to approximate further. But it will be a kind of comprehensive exercise for approximation. And here, I will come to, to my next point. Why it's so important to, for, for Ukraine to have a sense of purpose, uh, a sense of direction in the future agreement, and I mean the European perspective for Ukraine. You know, uh, European perspective is probably one of the unique ideas which is perceived and considered through the whole Ukrainian society as, as a sort of uniting idea. Because of Ukrainian history, and it's quite complicated history, there are a number of divisive issues on the agenda. If you talk about NATO, for example, uh, in different parts of Ukraine, for example, in Lviv and Donetsk, if you talk about Russian language, they could be somehow considered and perceived as divisive issues. But European integration enjoys always, in every part of Ukraine, at least 70% support. And it's not just about, you know, to get more prosperity. It's not to get, probably, more stability. And it's not just to uh, inject more momentum in, in, uh, in, in Ukrainian reforms. For Ukraine, and I would risk to be, uh, to be quite plain on that, it's a sort of civilizational choice. It probably sounds a bit pathetic, but at the end of the day, uh, for Ukraine, with her history, with her mentality, with the understanding of the place of Ukraine in the, in, the, in, the, in the present world, it's extremely important to have a sense of direction. And this is exactly the point why we've been fighting for a sort of European perspective in the future agreement. And for us, the best way out of this conundrum was the possible reference to the Article 49 of the, uh, of the Treaty on the European Union, a sort of reference which will show the way. And let me stress this point here. We are not talking about, uh, about a sort of membership promise, not at all. We are talking about possibility which could, you know, somehow you know, take into reality, or not somehow take into reality, provided Ukraine should meet all the respective criteria. Uh, let me, you know, shortly inform you where we are on our negotiations on the association agreement. Two weeks ago we were able, over last 
important round of negotiations in Brussels to eliminate every important contentious point on the FTA part, free trade agreement part of the association agreement. Now there are no points of political importance. Uh, we, uh, we still have uh, to do a bit of technical work here, but we have a clear vision where we are on free trade. We still have a number of issues regarding the political part of the agreement, but uh, you know, there is uh, again, and I would like to reiterate it, just one issue of special political importance. It's the issue about European perspective for, for Ukraine here. And understanding, uh, you know, the mood in the European Union, understanding the, the sensitivity of, of this issue for a number of member states, is still critically important for Ukraine, you know, to, to, um, to have this, this, this sense of direction. And uh, let me also stress here, as, as a special point, that we we are grateful for continual support for, for you know by for, from the Irish side in this exercise because you you were you know well very very sustainable in, in this support and it, it's exactly what what does matter for for Ukraine. So our ambition is of course to wrap up negotiations till the end of this year and, uh, you know, to formally proclaim it till the end of the year. And uh, we are quite close to these important goals, and we'll, it will be, of course, an uh, important milestone in EU-Ukraine cooperation. <coughs> Let me turn here to um, another important uh, bit of our cooperation with the European Union, and it's about visa-free. Visa-free is extremely important, not only in the sense of, um, of, of facilitation and further liberalization of visa procedures. It's extremely important for, uh, you know, to demonstrate the progress here for any Ukrainian. If you go to, 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 to a street in every Ukrainian city and ask the people about the sense of European integration, the answer will be about European perspective, about visas, and about further economic cooperation. It's, it's as simple as that. So visas do matter. Um, uh, last year in, uh, in Brussels, over the last EU-Ukraine summit, we, we were given EU action plan on visa-free. It's, uh, it's a sort of two-phase document. Uh, practically in, in, less, in less than a year, we also succeeded uh, to wrap up the legislative phase of this plan. Uh, now we understand uh, we are doing quite fine. Uh, a month ago we had the first report produced by the European Commission on uh, our achievements, and it's quite a positive report. Exactly last week, yeah, last week, we had missions from Brussels exploring and checking up uh, our progress where we are on different reforms. In the, in the weeks to come, we will have another assessment, and we believe that on the basis of this assessment, we will be able to proceed to the second phase, implementation phase of the, of the visa action plan. You know, visa-free is, of course, the core element uh, in visa dialogue, but uh, we have also other tracks, like visa facilitation, Back in 2007, we were able to negotiate and uh, a bit later also to ratify visa facilitation agreement. And there is quite considerable progress on that. Three years ago, I will give you just a couple of numbers. Ukrainians got a bit more than 400,000 Schengen visas. Last year, it was a million. 100,000 visas 
So the progress is definitely there. And it's important point for people-to-people -people contacts. But for me, it's also critically important that the share of multi-annual visas is also growing because the sense for facilitation is also for me that Ukrainians simply don't need to go to a consulate for, uh, for every time they should enter the European Union for, for a week or two. So the idea to collect probably more than 20 documents uh, it is a challenge, actually. And it's still quite expensive for a lot of Ukrainians because uh, practically a visa for a Schengen visa for Ukrainians costs at the moment 30, 30 euro. It's, it's not quite a sum of money. But to collect all the documents and to, you know, to produce all the uh, translations, one probably needs up to 200 or 300,000, or uh, for, 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 for 300 euros. And it's quite quite considerable sum of money. And it's exactly the point where we still have the potential to, um, to work quite intensively on further visa facilitation. And of course, let me just also mention the idea of small border traffic, because a lot of Ukrainians living quite close to Ukrainian EU border now uh, have the possibility to cross the border just without any visa, but with the uh, appropriate permits given. Uh, I, would, uh, I would also like to specially touch upon uh, different uh, ideas about sectoral integration. From February 1st this year, we become the member of the Energy Community Treaty. It's a very important document which uh, would bring up uh, European standards to the whole uh, Ukrainian energy sector. We are working on the same approach in the transport sphere, in other uh, important spheres. At the end of the day, it's of course about, um, about full integration of different sectors into the EU market. Uh, I, could, I could, of course, give you a number of other examples here, and we could discuss it over our Q&A session. But let me address one, one simple point at the end of my short presentation. Um, you know, I, I hear quite, quite often different, different voices about, uh, about uh, uh, changing conditions around Ukraine, around the European Union. And the point is, uh, in uh, the last wave for of enlargement has been started in uh, early 90s, the last successful uh, of enlargement. And <clears throat> at that time we had different European Union, different Ukraine, and actually a sort of different uh, world around us. And the instrument for, for further integration was exactly so-called Europe agreements, which are extremely similar in substance and scope to our association agreement. A bit, <coughs> a bit later, a, a wave of signing so-called association and stabilization agreement uh, with Balkan countries have been initiated. And uh, it was also a sort of successful exercise, although the perspective for the Balkans, uh, you know, uh, depend quite considerably on the internal uh, development in, in, in the European Union. But at the end of the day, uh, we understand quite well that the further progress on the European integration depends mainly and overwhelmingly uh, actually on Ukraine, on her ability and her capacity to undertake comprehensive reforms. And here you definitely know that uh, in Ukraine we are now have either implemented or in the pipeline packages of reform in 21 different spheres which is uh, the most comprehensive reform exercise in Ukrainian history. Uh, the adoption of uh, the tax code, pension reforms uh, are just 
a couple of examples of that. But my point here, <clears throat> with all the changing conditions, we, we believe that the future association agreement will become an important, effective, and reliable framework for, for integration into the European Union. It's our strategic goal, and uh, we also believe that such an integration is also in the strategic interest of the European Union. And as a last point, uh, I, <laughs> I remember um, an, old, uh, an old joke, actually, uh, told me 20 plus years ago, uh, it was mentioned that I'm, I'm, I'm physicist, you know, by education, and it was in one of the lectures. Uh, you know, Albert Einstein lectured in the Zurich Technical University, and once he was prepared, you know, to carry out another exam on, on physics, and he, he distributed uh, different tasks among his students, and one student erased his hand wavering and task, professor, you know, but these are the same tasks you gave us two years ago. And uh, Einstein answered, it's fine, but the answers are different now. And my point, the answers could be different now, but you know, the goal, especially the strategic goal, is, is critically important. To, to achieve, and uh, the prerequisite for that should be, uh, should be successful reforms back in Ukraine, and the frame for these reforms will be, uh, will be set up by the future association agreement. Let me stop here. Many thanks for your kind attention, and I would be ready and happy, of course, to take up any sort of questions. On uh, on area on any area on uh, Ukrainian or not just Ukrainian foreign policy. Many thanks again. Thank you.